keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the song if you want to turn to mark number 365 number 365 will be our song of invitation after the lesson this evening after you've got that marked we'll sing number 400 number 400 i'll ask if you're able to please stand as we sing the song as well all three verses I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth over everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. Tempests may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alone at the overcast skies, the Master looks on at my strife. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. Jesus walks close to my side, living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. From a home safe and a sheltering home, I'm living by faith.
As you can see by our song leader this evening, Brother Carey, still out of pocket. We appreciate Brother Andrew Gary leading us in our singing tonight. Andrew is another one of our very talented young men. Very glad to have him here and the good work that he does when he leads singing for us. We appreciate Andrew doing that for us tonight. We want to welcome everyone to our services. We're glad that you're here. We appreciate your presence. We hope that you're planning to stay for our dinner after our services here tonight and uh, take part in some of the wonderful food that will be available. We'd also like to encourage you to make your plans and make your invitations for our gospel meeting next week, beginning on Sunday. 9 o'clock a.m. will begin our first service here in the auditorium with everyone gathered together. All of our Bible classes, our older Bible classes, will meet in here. Brother Greer will be addressing us, and we look forward to a great week. Hope that you will be here for every service, not just come, but bring folks with you uh, when you come this coming week. There is a, uh, a gap in the information regarding greeters for Sunday. Um, the reason for that is there is not a single group responsible for greeting on Sunday. We'd like for representatives from all of our service teams uh, to be present Sunday for greeting. So uh, when you all talk about that tonight in your service team meetings, we'd like to have representatives from every service team present. So uh, make sure that you discuss that and have your representatives uh, to help us on Sunday uh, during the day. And then the other w uh, services during the weeknight are described for each group that is there. I'd like to begin with our reading this evening in 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5 verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Paul also wrote to the church when he addressed them in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. And he described Satan in these terms. He said to be cautious, to take care, lest Satan take advantage of us. And then Paul added, for we are not aware, or for we are not unaware of his devices. We know what he's doing. We've been warned. What are Satan's devices? Wouldn't it be great if uh, every time there was a temptation in life that you got a, a warning, some sort of a, uh, an alert, a beacon? I know you've been watching television or uh, listening to your radio or something and have that obnoxious noise come blaring over the television or the radio station with those beeps. The emergency broadcast system. This is a test. This is only a test. If this has been an actual emergency, uh, you know the drill. Well, what if every time there was a situation in life where we were going to be tested, where there was going to be a moral crisis, where a, an object lesson or some challenge to our moral character was preceded by some warning? I suspect our responses would be different. If rather than the events unfolding as they do in life, often disguised so that we are not recognizing them unless we're very cautious, we might respond differently. If, for example, you had a, a list of choices. If you choose this choice, you will be going to jail. If you make this choice, everything that you've worked for regarding your family will be lost. If you make this choice... Would you still push those buttons if you knew that was the case? All of us were horrified a couple of weeks ago when a couple of bombs went off in Boston and so many lives were changed. I wonder if the two young men who were responsible for that, I'm sorry, allegedly responsible for that, had there been an option there saying, when you detonate that device, 
your life as you know it will come to an end. Now maybe they already knew that. Maybe they didn't. What are Satan's defenses or devices, his, his uh, way of getting into our lives and challenging us? How does he get a foothold in us? Our lesson tonight definitely has an application to our young people. But it's not exclusively for our young people. All of us, regardless of age, need to be aware of Satan's devices. I'd like to look at a couple of stories, current stories, this week from the headlines taken right out of national news this week. A 24-year-old math teacher in Iowa has been charged with sexual misconduct. It would seem that the teacher had exchanged nude photographs with at least four students and then had physical relations with them. Now, is it likely that teacher thought that those things would go completely unrecognized and unidentified? Perhaps. But it's far more likely that they just didn't really think it through. That one step led to another, one indiscretion led to another, and there was an aspect that they expected that this would stay anonymous, that somehow they would be able to keep these things in the shadows. But that is not the way it happened. And some of you probably are thinking, yeah, and that pervert should spend the rest of his life in jail. It wasn't a he. It was Ashley Anderson of Iowa. Wouldn't you hate to read your name in the national papers behind that story? Or another activity just this week. A teacher was fired from Stockton, California, Lincoln High School. Why? The teacher was charged with setting up pornographic websites. Not just doing it, but doing it at school, using the school computer, specifically the laptop computer provided by the school system for the instruction of students. The school board, when they met, said that the behavior of this teacher was abhorrent and immoral. And they dismissed her from teaching. 37 years old, her name was Heidi Kaislin. I'm not picking on teachers, these are just the news. Then a week ago, last Friday, the Salt Lake City or the Salt Lake Tribune reported that another math teacher, basketball coach, got involved with a student, this time a student at uh, the student's home, another female teacher who has been charged with sexual misconduct with another student. The assailant, 22-year-old Courtney Louise of Riverton, Utah. Now let's go back to where we started our discussion a few minutes ago. If the options were laid out in front of these mostly young ladies, 24, 22, 37 years old. And it said, if you pursue the course of action that you're involved in, your names are going to be being read across the United States of America. You are going to be labeled as a sexual offender. For the rest of your life, you will have to put on any application that ever comes up that you are a sexual offender. And that as a felony will follow you until you die. You'll lose your job. In the case of these three persons, I don't think that any of them were married. If so, the um, news reports did not describe that. But if those options were set out there, this is these are the consequences if you go down that path. Would they have done so? I have no way to judge that. But I suspect, understanding human nature the way I do and the way we are, 
if there was a moment of pause, I'm sure that all of us at some point in our lives have experienced or done things that we are ashamed of. Paul said all of us are guilty of sin. We've all sinned and fall short of the gospel. The good news of the gospel describes the moral code of God, describes for us how God wants us to live, and all of us have failed in that. But if there had been some point where we're just about to go over the edge, we're about to make a decision that would affect our lives permanently, what if there was just a pause button, not in our control, but someone else's? And right before we came to the moment of decision, when the temptation struck us, if there was a pause and someone said for a moment, okay, now wait a minute, you're about to make a very important decision in your life, and if you choose to follow after your present path, these are going to be the lifelong consequences that come. Would you consider your life any different? My guess is that most of us would. At least I have that belief in humanity. That most of us, given that moment of pause to step back from the, the pull of our emotions, would make better choices. Now, I don't know that's the case. I just think it is likely. I'd like to go to the book of James for just a moment. James describes the process that we're involved in in this way. Now, he tells us that God doesn't tempt us with sin. When we're tempted, let's not lay that at God's feet. Instead, here's what happens. James chapter 1, verse 14. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Paul would write in the book of Romans, the wages of sin is death. We probably don't think about the, the concept of sin bringing that kind of punishment and it's certainly the case that everyone who has been confronted with sin, regardless of what it was, the three individuals that I described from the national headlines this week are all guilty of sexual sins. The Bible is certainly not uh, absent of sexual sins. And everyone who was tempted with some sexual sin did not commit them. For example... Joseph, in Genesis chapter 39, taken as a young man down to Egypt. He is now a prisoner, sold to Potiphar. While he is in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife begins to proposition Joseph, not once, not twice, but daily, over and over again, made overtures to him. And each time, Joseph rebuffed her. But finally, there was no one around. Joseph was with her alone in the house, and she set upon him. The conversation that is recorded for us in the book of Genesis chapter 39, Joseph defends his actions, and he says, I cannot do this. I cannot sin against God, and I cannot sin against my master. For his denial of being involved with Mrs. Potiphar, Joseph would be falsely accused of having tried to assault her and thrown into prison. There's another case of sexual sin found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It doesn't have the same outcome. The story in this case is of David who is out on his balcony and he sees Bathsheba and he lusts after her, and he calls for her, and he takes her. And not only is he involved in sexual immorality, but then he will be involved in lying and conspiracy and finally murder. And I wonder, knowing the, the man David, as we do, the man who wrote many of the Psalms, 
the man who God said was a man after God's own heart, knowing David as we do, I have to believe that David standing there on the precipice of, uh, of this event, standing on his balcony, looking down at this woman and lusting after her, if we'd had the pause button, suddenly stopped, and some voice had said to David, David, you're about to make a choice that is going to ruin your reputation. It's going to ruin your life. It is going to take from you the ability to build the temple of God like you want to. And from this moment on, those who hear about your greatness or your grandeur will also hear about the corruption that you're about to be involved in. Is this really what you want to do? Okay, hit play now and go back to live action. What would David's choice have been? I don't know that he wouldn't have gone through exactly the way he did. But my guess is that most of us, as we get caught up into temptation, do not stop and pause to think about the significance of what's about to happen. Maybe we don't recognize it as such, and that's my whole point, is that temptations come upon us in such a way that they are disguised. We don't appreciate what they are until it is too late. And yet, there is a morality here that ought to be aware as a part of us all the time. That's the reason why Peter gives us the instruction. Be sober. That is to be alert. Not to be, uh, not to be hung over. Not to be intoxicated. Not to be uh, dimmed down in some way. But to be alert. To be on guard. To be vigilant. Because there is a threat to you. What are Satan's devices? I don't know that it's all that complicated to understand how Satan gets us. James describes it pretty simple. We are involved in sin when we are taken by our own lusts and enticed. There's an interesting description that John has in 1 John chapter 2. There are three verses there to, that are very valuable to us, I believe. As James begin, or excuse me, as John begins in verse 15, describing, "Don't love the world. The things of the, this world are not truly important." But then he goes down to verse 16 and says this: "All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father." It's of the world. When we get back, if we take that step back and we begin to analyze the concepts of sin, what are they? Virtually all sin can be stuck into these categories. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh. Pride of life. Now that doesn't seem like it would be all that hard to defend against. Yes, people are going to be drawn away by sexual things, always have, probably always will. And there are lots of other reasons why people get involved with hatred and jealousy and greed and all other sorts of things. But they're going to reduce themselves back to these physical experiences that we want. There were some other stories that I also gleaned from the headlines this week. There was a story that came out of Raleigh, North Carolina. A man by the name of Jonathan Broyhill attacked a woman, Jamie Hahn, with a knife, stabbing her several times, and she died. Now, those are the basic facts, but there's a lot left out. This man... Jonathan Broyhill was actually a long-term friend of this woman. He was the best friend of her husband. He had been the best man in their wedding in 2009, some four years ago. It looks like from the Between the Lines reading of the story that there may have been some financial irregularities. The uh, husband and wife were political strategists and 
uh, political fundraisers, and the man who committed the crime uh, was an employee of the woman, so or at least worked for the same company that they did business with. So it looked like there probably could have been some some political or financial uh, things that uh, could have gotten wrong, and maybe he was going to be exposed and threatened her, or they're looking at all sorts of angles like this as they try to unravel this case. Take a look at the headlines, select the crimes, and then try to put a motive to it. And you're going to come back to, in almost all the cases, a very describable. You may not always be able to explain with a rationale so that you say, yeah, I can see why they did that. But you'll probably be able to tie it to some aspect of, of jealousy or greed or hatred or some satisfied lust of an individual. Somewhere there's a reason. Back to the book of Joshua, chapter 7, a man by the name of Achan. As the children of Israel took Jericho and defeated the land. And yet God had said everything that is in the city of Jericho is karim. It is dedicated to the service of God. And therefore, you can't have it. It belongs to God. You shall take nothing from the city of Jericho. God had made it, just like the commandment of the children of Israel, that they had to give the first offering of their, uh, of their livestock to God, the first fruits of their, uh, their goods to God. From the first, God took the sacrifice. So as He gives them the land of Canaan, the very first city, all of the ob- objects that they might have desired, God says, I'll take the first. But Achan lusted. There was gold and silver and and expensive garments. And he wanted them. And he took them. There's another story in the Old Testament. In the book of Kings, a man by the name of Ahab and his evil wife Jezebel. Here they weren't interested in gold and silver and and, uh, garments. They were interested in land. Ahab was a powerful king, but a little puny peasant man by the name of Naboth had a family farm, a vineyard, that was visible outside the king's window. And he lusted for it, and he wanted it. And he asked Naboth to sell it to him. Naboth refused to sell it to him. And the king was angry. He was prideful. He had a desire for something that he could not get. And now as king, he still could not get it. When Jezebel finds out why he is so upset, she arranges to have Naboth killed in a a despicable way. The story as it unfolds in 1 Kings chapter 21 is about nothing more than a little piece of land. Because of this, Ahab will lose his life. Jezebel will lose her life. Naboth will lose his life. And if you could hit that pause button and stop it right before Achan reached out for that gold and silver and that garment and said, if you take this, you're not only going to take your own life, but it's going to kill your family as well. Ahab, if you do this, you're going to destroy yourself as being king. You're going to give up all of that? You're going to give up being king? of Israel for this little piece of ground Haman's pride would consume him and that story unfolds in the book of Esther Samson's lust for women would be his downfall as well as Solomon's and Solomon would warn his own son and the book of Proverbs and tell him about the, the dangers of the woman and the lust after her. Solomon's own life described for us in 1 Kings chapter 11 where the text tells us that Solomon's many wives turned his heart away from God. And it doesn't seem very wise, does it? Of course, there's lots of other factors at work and lots of other stories. People are not always so shallow. They're not always so foolish and so selfish. Sometimes they act very generously and magnanimously and and wisely. 
Good Morning America also carried a story this week about a man named Cameron Lyle. He is a college athlete, Division I. He is a student at the University of New Hampshire. Shot putter. But some time ago, he agreed to be tested in a general screening for bone marrow transplants. And this last year, he showed up as a positive match for a 26-year-old young man who is dying with leukemia. And they contacted him and said, will you agree to be a bone marrow donor? One in 500, excuse me, one in 5 million chance of finding a perfect match for a bone marrow donor outside of your family, according to the statistics I read. And this man was a match for another young man just a few years older than him. What do you think he said? I'm telling you the story. You know where it's going. Of course he agreed to do it. And so now, because of that, he will not be able to compete anymore. His athletic time is gone. He's given up his senior ability to compete. But in an interview with Good Morning America, here's what he said. He said, 10 years from now, how do you think I'm going to face this moment? He says, do you think I'm going to say, you know, I sure wish I had gone to that track meet. Or do you think I would say, I sure wish I had saved that man's life. And he said, it's a no-brainer. I chose to save the man's life. I would like to believe that most of us, given that state of mind mentally, if we were given the options when we found ourselves in a difficult situation, positive or negative, whether it was to do something wonderful and good or whether it was to do something that was, that was selfish and immoral, that given the opportunity to, to reflect on the significance of where it was going, we would make better choices. Do you think that's the case? Do you agree with me there? So I hope that really the, the challenge is for us to, to be able to, in some way, pause ourselves to be able to make those kinds of thoughtful choices when the opportunities arise. Let's read from 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. Now... Times further along than that. Let's, uh, let's start reading in verse 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his own sins. Then Peter puts this at the end. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call on election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Take that list and superimpose it back over the discussions that we had of the people along the way. Those women who had sold themselves for such tawdry actions. If they had faith and virtue, and knowledge, and godliness, and self-control, would they have participated in those activities? No. This man, for whatever reason that he stabbed a, a close friend, would he have done so? 
No. Achan's theft? No. David's failure? Mm Mm-mm. Solomon? Samson? No. You see, Peter's provided the guidance for us if we'll protect our hearts and our lives, if we'll hold these things in place. As an action test, I don't know that this will always keep you out of trouble, but let me throw it out there nonetheless. And I'm doing this mostly for our young people, but uh, everyone else will be applicable to you as well. It's sometimes hard to decide. Let me rephrase that a little bit. It is sometimes hard to take the time when we're pondering a situation in life to, to weigh out the rights and the wrongs, the morals and the choices that are made. So let me make a real simple three piece test. Number one, would I be proud to tell my mother that I had done this? I'm not suggesting that everybody's relationship with their mother is perfect or that everybody's mother would want them to do what is right. But I'm going to assume that most are. That, that most moms are good, and if you're here, the chances are that that is going to be the case. And if you could tell your mom, Mom, guess what I did today? Can you go home and tell your mother that? Anything that you can probably go home and proudly tell your mom, guess what I did today? Is probably a good thing. Not necessarily always, but probably so. Let me give you a second one. You can tell your mom proudly. Number two, you would encourage your children to do it. If you are a parent, you understand the incredible change that comes upon your heart and your life when you have children. And things that you might have done as a youngster, you would not encourage your children to do. Would you encourage your children to do these things? And third, test. Twenty years from now, when I look back at this moment... Will I think about this as a moment of honor or a moment of shame? I don't know if we'll have the presence of mind to run that test, but I'm guessing that that simple test would have a high probability of altering our path. And these things are basically in line with what Peter has described of protecting our hearts and our minds. Honorable before God. Every day we make choices, lots of them. And if God's values guide us, then God will be proud of us. And if God's values don't guide us, then He won't. In the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, we have a wonderful little discussion in the middle of that chapter as the writer of Hebrews is talking about all of the individuals who have died in their faith. There's a break as he describes the concepts that are around some of the individuals that have been named by name. And he's talked about Abraham, and he's talked about uh, Noah, and he's talked about um, Abel. And then he comes down to verse 13. He says this, These all died in faith, not receiving the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. There was a recognition that the things that they were involved in were not the most important things, but there was some other consideration that needed to be made. And then the last verse I want to look at is verse 16. They desire a better country, that is a heavenly country, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, and He has prepared a city for them. They understand this life is not where things really matter. And because of the choices that they made, God is proud of them. Isn't that where you want to be? Last week when we were discussing the sermon, our, the weapons of our warfare, I left out a couple of uh, the pieces of equipment because of time. And I don't have time tonight to discuss them at length either. But the two that we left out to discuss were the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There is a reason why we decide to do good things. 
Now, there may be a reason why we decide to do bad things, too, but it's probably based on our personal self-wants, whatever we want to fulfill our immediate desires. But when we choose to do good things, it's because we have a value system, and there is something that drives us there, and usually that is connected back to our religious beliefs of what is right and wrong, our faith in God. And where do we get that faith strengthened and oriented and directed? From the Word of God. That's what guides us. And so I'll conclude with this reading from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word of God will direct us in how we should live our life. Oh, Satan's out there, all right. He's after us. He is seeking whom he may devour. But Paul also told us, that not only is Satan out there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, Paul said, With every temptation, there is also a way of escape. If you're looking for it. And that's the challenge. Whether we're looking or not. Life comes at us fast and quick. We have to make decisions sometimes in a hurry. The determination we've made in advance of our values are going to carry us through making those decisions. If we've already decided what's right and wrong, if we've already decided what's moral or what our goals are, then when these things come up, there won't be any real decision to be made. We'll have already decided, and we'll go in the right path. Watch out. The devil's out there. And if possible, he'll take you. God's Word will guide you along the path that leads to righteousness. Make that path your choice. Tonight, are you a Christian? Are you a child of God? If so, that not only means that you have given your life over to God, that you've repented of your sins, confessed your faith in Christ, and be baptized for the remission of sins to become a part of the kingdom of God, but it also means you've changed your life, that you are different, that you've made goals of, of a direction you want to be. I belong to God, and I want to do what's right. If you're not a Christian tonight, make the choice to become one. Render obedience to the gospel. Why wouldn't you, in a moment when this invitation song is sung, come forward and confess before this audience your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, and tonight be baptized into Christ, just like a young lady was this morning. It may be that as one of God's children, you're not faithful, and you need to come home. The invitation is for you. Tonight, if we can assist you spiritually, come while we stand and sing. Make it.
can keep me pure within. Thou of life, the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart, rise to all eternity. Tim for that lesson. In closing, we'll sing number 776. 776, if you want to turn there. You do not have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. That opportunity has been made available for you this evening. If you'll exit out the, the back doors there, you'll be shown where you can do that. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain? Will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure. to the rock which cannot move, rounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. It is safely moored, twill the storm withstand, for it is well secured by the Savior's hand, and the cables pass from his heart to mine, and defy the through strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, rounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold through the gathering night, When the anchor fast by the heavenly shore, with the storms all pass forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul stand fast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, rounded firm and deep in the same. Dear God, we thank Thee for this day that You've given us. We thank Thee for the blessing that You've given us, given us that we can come together, sing praises to Your name, and study from Your Word. Pray that You'll help us to put Your Word into our heart. Pray that You'll help us to be an example of those that we come in contact with. Pray that when we're tempted, that You'll help us to see the way of escape. Pray that You'll help us to focus on Your pathways that are right. Pray that You'll be with the elders here and guide the body always in your pathways of right. Pray that you be with Virginia Sanders and strengthen her, comfort her, and give her her health. Pray that you'll be with MacArthur during this time. Pray that you'll be with David Robinson and strengthen him and comfort him and give him health. Pray be with Tom and Mickey as they undergo difficulties with their arm. But most of all, we Thank Thee for the love that You've showered down upon us in sending Your only Son to die that cruel death so that we could one day have a home in heaven with You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.